Welcome everyone to Midnight in America. I'm Salvatore Babonis, your host, and Midnight in America is your weekly source for the most provocative global affairs content on the internet. This week's guest is Dutch sociologist Eric C. Hendricks, who will discuss how regime theory can improve our understanding of China. It's Midnight in America, 4 p.m. in Sydney. Eric C. Hendricks, what time is it in Beijing? I think we may have lost Eric. Yeah, so it's it's one. It's, <laughs> it's, oh, no, 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 no. It's, I, it's one. It's one. Um, it's one in the afternoon here in China. It's just that uh, the sometimes the audio is a little bit bad. So then I'm gonna I'm gonna respond in slow motion. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about that as a way to start. I mean, you know, we're having trouble with just a simple audio connection between Australia and China. Uh, I mean, is the issue that China is a poor developing country with very low quality internet? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's yeah, the not... internet's always bad here. Uh, even if you even if you uh, seek out uh, the best, the, the quickest the quickest places, then still for some reason there's always uh, as soon as you make a connection to the international world, there it always there's always a problem somehow. So, uh, it, I, I mean, smooth the well really well functioning internet is extremely rare in this country. I had a friend who lived in the um, in Egypt for. For a few years, and when he came to China, he said, "Wow, the like the internet here in China is the worst I've ever seen." In that. And he had lived in and he had lived in um, in in many in many third world countries. Uh, so yeah, but it's the it's the great rule of I, I guess it's the great firewall of China uh, but, that that makes everything everything worse. Well, that's what I want to ask you about because uh, you know, if I understand right, you, you speak Chinese, and st I mean, you do speak Chinese, right? And and so you, yeah, I speak I speak intermediary Chinese. So I've lived okay. in China in total four years, and I, I worked okay. so, those four years. I worked two years as a postdoc at Peking University. Okay, so that's really what I meant. You know, you've been in China four years, two years as a postdoc. You must know the Chinese internet much better than people like me, who are monolingual English speakers. You know, I only know the international internet. Does the Chinese internet work quickly if you're in China? accessing websites in China. Yes. So like when you talk to people. Yes, it does. So it's not a technical issue. It really is the firewall issue. Is, is that is that so the problems with the Internet in China are not technical. It's the political firewall. Yeah. So I guess the I guess the great firewall of China is just one of those um, aspects of the Chinese regime, not just in the sense that it's, of course, built to create a political censorship, but uh, also because it's it, it's it's one of the ways in which China is cut off from the world. Uh, China is China is on the, is is only half open. So there are parts of China that are integrated into world society and to the globalized world order, but there are also parts that are shielded off. And China is a is still compared to most other countries in the world uh, extremely closed off, really? and and that also determines its position in the world. Uh, perhaps I should just dive right in because. Um, well, I, well, I want to um, ask you a little. Uh, because China, China has a very peculiar position in the world, right? Uh -huh. It's a powerful country, but it's it has a very it's a very different kind of player um, than the Western liberal democracies, which are which are much more open and integrated into world society. Right. Well, let me ask you. You know, I want to get back to this question of of the firewall of China because many people will only have vaguely heard of the Great Firewall of China and don't really know what it is. I mean, you, you mentioned, I thought it was very interesting, you mentioned it's not necessarily about censorship. I mean, obviously, they're not attempting to censor our video conference. So what is it about? If it's not about censorship, what is it about? I'm oh, sorry, you, you said, that what's the great firewall of China well, about? It? If it's not yeah, about censorship? What, if it's I, not all, if time, it's, yes, yes, if it's not just censorship, obviously, they're not trying to censor our video conference, then what is the purpose? Oh, oh, oh I, 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 I guess I, I'm, I'm like, uh, I think that's the great firewall of China. I mean, it's, it's, it, it is meant to censor the Chinese, right? It's to cut off Chinese from internet information um, coming from the outside. Right. Uh, so it's not so directly targeted to Westerners, but of course, when you're in China, you're, you're, you're sort of caught in it. Um, 
But, uh, I, but I mean, uh, I think because it's there and because it's such a large machine, uh, uh -huh. you'll see a um, you'll see that everything that crosses the boundary goes a little bit slower. Uh, really? Sometimes I have these emails I send uh, from uh, from a Chinese um, email provider to a uh, to uh, to, uh, to, uh, to Gmail, mm -hmm. and then I see that there's a time lag sometimes, even. So there's it it and, and, but it's, it works very strange. Like you even have to pay more money. Uh, to use foreign internet to go to foreign websites, then if you so if you have an okay. uh, if you if you have a phone and you have an um, and you pay for your internet, right? You actually have to pay more often for using foreign websites, and so they they they, they even differentiate between foreign and and, and, and national internet, which oh, is something so, I've never seen in any other country. I've never heard of that. So there's no net neutrality in China. That's for sure. No such thing as net neutrality in China. <laughs> net neutrality. <laughs> well, I think I think the net has never been neutral. I think the net is owned by a Chinese Communist Party, just like everything else in the end is owned by the Chinese Communist Party. So I, I mean, I'm I'm joking in a in, in to some extent, but I mean, the um, it is of course the case that the, the the Chinese Communist Party has an enormous footprint in the media, in the internet, uh, on the internet, uh, in in society, in 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 education. Um, of course, they dominate politics. Of course, they dominate the military. Then they're in large firms in every large firm they have there they've planted their people they have political commissars so there is no true independence from the chinese communist party anywhere in chinese society now obviously i want to talk to you about regime theory but i also want to pick up on on one other thing you mentioned a moment ago you said parts of china are really integrated into the world but parts of china are not did you mean that geographically, mm. Shanghai is integrated and uh, you know Gansu is not, or did you mean that in terms of social strata, you know, some people are integrated and some people are not? Yes, yeah, so, no, I, I don't mean it geographically. I mean it in terms of the functional, the functional fields. So if you have these uh, functionally differentiated fields, law, uh, politics, uh, journalism, education, science, business, right? The, uh, the, functional, the functionally differentiated fields, um, you'll, you'll see that, um, well, first of all, they're only partly differentiated from politics. So politics is, an, is a very intrusive force in these fields. So compared to Western countries throughout the, we sometimes say, right, we sometimes say that uh, there's there's no division of power in Chinese politics, but actually it's much when we have more of a division of power in politics in Western countries. Mm -hmm. um, but it's much broader than that. You you have less of a division of power throughout Chinese society. So the political center is much more deeply penetrating into all the f social fields in society, whether it's business, journalism, academia, science, uh, you name it, right? So so what that entails is that there's the, these fields are less differentiated, less autonomous from the political center than they are in Western societies. Now, because they're, because they're more controlled by the political center, they're also less integrated into world society. Because these functionally differentiated fields, um, yeah, if, they, if they get in, um, in, insofar as they have real autonomy, insofar as they have real professionalism, they connect with uh, other professionals in the international world, right? right. So, so the, but in, insofar as the political party, the communist party, is, is politically controlling them and manipulating them, it holds them, it keeps them outside of uh, world society. So in, with journalism, that would be very literally, right. literal in terms of an information cutoff, right? But in, in academia, it, it would, for instance, it could also be something more indirect or in, a, in the sense that um, you, will have, you will have scholars promoted on the basis of their scholarly credentials in terms of the international academic system. Whereas you will also have scholars promoted based on uh, political credentials and political connections in the Communist Party. Now, of course, most most of it is, is more complex and in between, but you, you see what I mean, right? So the real, I, the way I see the Chinese Communist Party is as a kind of, is as an enormous force that is actually outside of the, the Western-led global world order. I mean, there is nothing, the Communist Party is completely shielded off, right? Like in terms of information, in terms of people. So insofar as the Communist Party is controlling something in Chinese society, it's holding it outside of the world society. 
Now, I'm not surprised to hear that journalism and political science, you know, are very closely integrated with the political sphere in China, right? I mean, that's a no-brainer. Of course, a, a, you know, a repressive communist government would be deeply embedded in fields like journalism and political science. But what if we were to move beyond that? I mean, if we were to think of, of dentistry, uh, you know, having your teeth fixed, uh, would dentistry as a field in China be, uh, you know, would, would that be a politicized field in China or would dentistry be something where, you know, Chinese dentists could openly access global knowledge and travel and bring in techniques? I mean, so like, let's get out of politics. I'm not surprised to hear that journalism is politicized. What about things like dentistry mm. or agriculture or, you know, yeah, unsensitive fields. Like that. It's funny that you. It's funny that you mentioned dentistry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because, uh, 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 because a friend of mine actually, uh, he's a prof Melvin Schutte, a professor at um, or lecturer at uh, Amsterdam University, also right. mentioned that to me just a few days ago, because he said that he said that well, in the end, when when people go to the dentist, uh, they want a professional dentist. They don't right. want a uh, politically correct dentist. <laughs> political dentist. Um, um, but so even though that um, that's that sounds true, it, it's not always the case. For instance, in during the Cultural Revolution, when they were uh, when the slogan was "Better Red Than Expert," uh, they were actually hunting down and uh, suppressing and out and and marginalizing all these experts, including dentists. Right. So if you were a really good socialist dentist, you're probably going to be promoted or like get get really? going to be made to head dentist. And if you don't have the right connections, you're going to like perhaps be fired, right? So there was a, there was at least a very extreme moment during, in, during Maoism when it would actually go after everyone. Uh, but of course now China is more practical, right? So they don't, they try to like leave dentistry alone, I suppose. Um, uh, but, uh, and, and then there are a couple of things which are like heavily, heavily suppressed. And then a lot is in between. So like, it's very, it's very nuanced. So for instance, recently I was talking to a, um, to, uh, to a legal scholar and he told me that the uh, so rule of law is a big issue right now in China. And rule of law is very interesting because, you know, they realized, the Communist Party realized that they need some rule of law. They need some autonomous legal field. If they completely politically control it, it right. doesn't work, right? right? Because in order to manage a complex economy where you have like a, a lot of firms in conflict with each other, right. um, may, having, um, having contracts, uh, being involved in, in, in complex transactions, you need a functional legal field to some extent. Because right. uh, just for managing conflicts in a in a complex economy, right? But at the same time, if you fully have an autonomous legal field, it becomes it you know it becomes a real force of independence right. uh, because the law could also apply it could also be applied to the ruling to the ruling people in the end to the ruling class, right? So what kind of happens is that commercial law has throughout the last decade or so becomes much more transparent much more like a real legal system as we have it in the West. So you have judges doing their work, you have lawyers doing their work, you have prosecutors doing their work. You know, the rule, the law is you know, somewhat systematically applied. That's, that's commercial law. But then when it, when it comes to criminal law, it's still an absolute jungle right now. It's still that you know, bribes, political connections are much more uh, likely to determine the outcome than, than, than anything else. Um, and then you have the, um, and then you have, of course, any political case. Well, well forget it, right? That any political case is political from from top to bottom. Right. Uh, now, so that's uh, it, like in a nutshell, that is actually the ch what they call the China model, was, or the way I see it. So I have a very cynical idea of what the China model is. So Daniel Abel he talks of the China model, and then it's a really good thing, right? But in my mind, that is the China model: the attempt to kind of cherry pick. Uh, things from liberal democracy, from right. Western liberal democracy. So they're like, okay, we'll, we'll, because we'll have the judges and the lawyers and the courtrooms, which, by the way, they didn't have in Maoist China, right? There were no lawyers in Maoist China. So they, you know, they import parts of the system, but then they only implement it, implement the parts they like. And they try to make that work. And the question is, if it really, if it can really work in the long run. Right. It, uh, you know, I'm really I interested by the fact that you brought up the Cultural Revolution in Maoist China. And uh, I like that, well, I, I don't like, but I, I enjoyed the slogan, uh, you know, better, better read than expert, uh, which reminded me actually of yeah. uh, Socrates, uh, the Greek philosopher, 
who through Plato's uh, dialogues uh, supposedly said better honest than expert. You, you know, would you rather have an expert physician or an honest physician? And he said, well, you'd rather have an honest physician uh, who would <laughs> know the limits, you know, than have an expert physician who might, you know, accidentally kill you. Uh, but, uh, but moving forward, I keep hearing uh, people in the press and in the, in the uh, political commentary comparing Xi Jinping to Mao Zedong. And to my mind, this is exactly yeah. the issue on which they're completely opposite. That, that is, Mao was anti-expert, but my impression is that today's Communist Party is a regime of experts. And that's why they're admired in some places uh, as being, uh, you know, an, an expert-based governance. Uh, what's the name of the, the Canadian political scientist at Tsinghua University who's always writing about uh, the China model being a better model of governance. Uh, I'm forgetting his name. Uh, but, but, I mean, what's your feeling on this? I mean, is Xi Jinping the anti-Mao? Is today's Chinese Communist Party a party of experts? Uh, or am I off base on that? So, Salvatore, first, like, you say so many interesting things, right? <laughs> but I hear this, like, I have, like, these five to ten second gaps there's in oh. between and they just fall out so i heard you say i heard you say well xi jinping and mao and then i didn't hear anything and then as i heard isn't he the, isn't he the anti-mao and then i didn't hear anything so so you asked whether he was xi jinping because xi jinping is more focused on professionalization than mao so he's well, more I... on the side of the experts is that more technocratic is that what you're asking well the the my own understanding of the changes is that uh well, now so now so now there's a bleep again, and I can't hear anything. Wait. Let's shut yes, the go. Internet. Um, my own understanding is that Xi Jinping has promoted a, a government of by experts. Uh, that is, it's the anti-Mao. Uh, Mao wanted to get rid of experts, but the current Communist Party fetishizes experts. Uh, or, or am I wrong? Uh, I mean, I'm curious. Uh, you know the situation better than Oh, me. no. So I heard... I heard my own understanding, bleep, or am I wrong? So I didn't hear anything between <laughs> those things. I'm so sorry, Salvatore. Again, my own understanding is that the current communist <laughs> regime fetishizes experts, which is the exact opposite of Mao. Yes. Expert. Yes. Okay, now I got it. I got it now. They're great, great, great. Um, but what's yeah, so, so, yeah, yeah. yeah, so sorry that I, that I took so long. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get this in bits and pieces. So, um, so the, yeah, the, the, it, well, the way I see it, uh, fetishizes, and I wouldn't say they fetishize um, professionals unconditionally, right? right? So they, yes, they like to use experts. They, they like to modernize China, right? Modernizing China is one of their two main goals. The Communist Party has two goals. Uh, first goal, maintaining political control. Second goal, modernizing China. Now, the, the official line on this is that those two things go very well together, but I, I would disagree, right? So because if you want to modernize society, you have to professionalize society. Okay. But in order to professionalize the key fields in society, law, business, academia, journalism, in order to professionalize these, you have them to give them more space from political control, from political steering, why does political steering and control diminish professionalism? Well, because of course, you know, as you as you rightly point out, you know, they like to use professionals. They like the experts, right, to some extent. But why does it structurally diminish professionalism, this kind of penetrating political control? Well, because it puts the wrong incentives in the field. When when somebody is climbing up the ranks in in whether it's uh, you know social science or business, you know, in the end, the incentive isn't purely put on functioning dif differentiated accomplishment. So like if you're if you're a businessman in China, you know, you can you can know you can perhaps start a small firm, but in the end if you want to get really big, you need some political connections. So in the end it's not the reward system doesn't just purely reward business innovation, smart marketing, uh, uh, an understanding an understanding of the consumer. Like it it it, it one of the main incentive like one of the main criteria for success is 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 the ability to effectively network in the political field. So so what you get is that the incentive structure is polluted, 
it's heteronomized, right? So, so that structurally diminishes the professionalization. Now, because in every field in Chinese society, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be purely rewarded based on your actual abilities and competences in the field. You would be at least partly rewarded uh, by, your, by your ability to, to politically network and, 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 and in your political resources. So, so in that way, the Communist Party constantly structurally undermines professionalization in all fields and hence modernization. But then, but then the little, you know, the little professionalism that does emerge, it tries to use, of course, and it, you know, it may celebrate. Um, so, but then if you look at it that way, the two main objectives of the Chinese Communist Party are in full, uh, are, in, are in full contradiction because, on the, uh, uh, you know, because they, they want to maintain political control at all costs by having an extremely strong footprint for our Chinese society. Mm. And second, they want to modernize China. But, but the thing that's keeping the modernization down is the, is the lack of professionalism, which is mainly caused by the enormous footprint of the Chinese Communist Party. And there's also, there's also, this also the, um, relates to the uh, variable of opening up, right? In order to move further modernize China, they need to open up more. But, in, you know, their financial system, their business, their, their academic system, everything, right? Throughout, you know, their journalism, any, everything. Every field needs to be more open up to the outside world. Uh, but, you know, that also diminishes control. So they don't really like opening up. So that's why you have this constant dynamic of, you know, opening up a little bit further and then going back a little bit, perhaps opening up, no, no going back in this, this hesitant back and forth. And in the end, these two things I mentioned, right, this hesitant back and forth uh, concerning opening up and closing off, on the one hand, and this political control of the functioning differentiated fields on the other, those are actually not two things. They're two dimensions, they're two sides of the same coin. Right? Because by, by allowing the field more autonomy and uh, you give it more room to professionalize according to its autonomous standards, which also entails it, it opening up to the world, to, uh, to the world system. Right. Whereas if you, you know, if you politically control it, you, 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 you close it off to an extent and you pollute the evaluate, evaluation structure uh, for measuring uh, success and uh, distributing resources within the field. Right. And uh, you, I know you pull all of this together into something or, or a form of regime theory. Uh, so I think you know, get an understanding of how different fields are aligned with the political field. So even if you're in certainly academia or business, but even if you're in medicine, to some extent, you're aligned with politics, right? Everything is aligned uh, with politics. In mm. some way. How does that generalize into something you call regime theory? Right. What's the connection with regime theory? Oh, sorry, I, di I didn't hear that yeah. last thing you how said. Like in some in some way, you're always aligned with politics, and then with, and then you didn't. Uh, and, then does, I, and you said I, I pull this all yeah, together. Yeah. How does that pull together into regime theory? How does it connect together to regime theory to become a single regime ah, theory? Okay, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so so sorry, Salvatore, no, that, no, that I, you know I have to keep asking you to repeat yeah, yourself. Yeah, yeah. I feel so bad about it because I I, I see you talk, you speaking, and I'm and I get these snippets, you know. Um, so and I, I sometimes I guess, but I don't want to you know <laughs> misguess what you're what you're asking me. So so yeah, the, so I tie this into regime theory because I think that the most fundamental regime difference between Chinese society and, the, and, and liberal, Western liberal democracies is the field pluralism. So now I use the regime concept in a kind of society-wide society sense. So in the sense of the, the ancient Greek term politeia, not in the very limited modern sense of just political regime, right? right? I think that, the, the, I, so you have, I'm spoke, speaking of it as like a kind of societal regime. And, and as a societal regime, China has always been, or at least throughout the last few centuries, been more field unified than Western societies. Now, there has been enormous changes and shifts in the form of Chinese society, right? There's been a, a regime transformations and evolutions, etc. But and it's, it's over the last four centuries, let's say, same in the Western countries. Still, if you look at the big picture over the last, at least the last four or five centuries, the structure of Chinese, the big structural difference between Western societies and China, and it, and it remains true to this day, is that China is less field differentiated, is more field unitary. 
whilst the West is more field pluralistic. So, you know, so in, you know, of course, like in the Maoist totalitarianism, this was very extreme. You had like a party state dominating all other organizations and institutions and fields in society, right? But, but even nowadays, China is still much less field differentiated than, than the West. And already in the imperial in imperial times, China was less still differentiated because you had the Mandarin class, which was extremely dominating because it tried to monopolize all forms of authority, power, and prestige. Right, the, the Mandarin official, the Confucian scholar official, the Mandarin was supposed to be. They were the politicians, the bureaucrats, the poets, the philosophers, the judges, the richest people. And sometimes also the people pulling the shots during wartime, so the military commanders. Uh, they were supposed to be the, the total human being. And that left very little room for other autonomous development in, uh, in civil society, right? In society as a whole. So what you got is like in the, West, in the West, you had all kinds of big industrial firms emerging, right? Like in China, you didn't have those. If you were like, if you were a business person in China, you could, you could have a small family business, but as soon as it got bigger, uh, the, the mandarins would take your stuff away, right? The only way you could really become rich, super rich, was by actually becoming a mandarin yourself or connecting yourself to a mandarin clan. Right. So like there was never, like there was never an incentive or like it was like real success in business was eventually punished, right? So they kept down business that way. And it was the same with, with you know, philosophy and uh, academia and the whole, the whole shebang. It, it, and, and now that you have the Chinese Communist Party, right? We see a lot of... This changes, right? China has become a nation state. China has a Chinese Communist Party that's organizationally modeled after the Leninist Soviet Union. Um, but it's also still building on that longer cultural heritage. Yeah, I think it's it, it's interesting that you draw the, the historical uh, precedents because I see a, a lot of what you're talking about, I think, would also have applied to Taiwan uh, until the 1980s even though the nationalist government was very anti-communist, it was still very similar in mm. the regime sense to what you're yeah. describing in communist China. Uh, you keep comparing China and the West. How would you compare China mm. and other middle-income countries? I mean, is what you're describing about China something distinctive about China, or is it the same in Russia, in India, in Mexico, in Brazil? Uh, how would it compare? No, yeah. How would China compare to other yeah, actually, countries? Yeah, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, China is really has a very unique history because, um, and and even nowadays, there's nothing there's nothing in the world that even that that's that's that really resembles China, apart from perhaps North Korea or the uh, to some extent. Uh, because uh, the Chinese Communist Party is, I mean, the Chinese Communist Party nowadays, don't forget, it's the large, it's, it's, it's probably the most powerful organization on earth, the most, po most powerful single organization on earth. It has, a, it has 90 million members, it controls the second economy in the world. Right. Like, the United States is a more powerful country, right? But the, the United States is much more pluralistic. Right. So the, the, the Chinese Communist Party is, is it's like a very unique institution, right? And if you look at the longer tra regime trajectory of, of China, it's very unique. It's completely. It's because for the mostly the the rest of the world, you see the following. You see you see kind of two kinds of countries. You have developed Western countries, which have a lot of institutionalization, which have a lot of developed institutions and organizations throughout society in a pluralistic shape, and then you have societies in the third world that have just lower levels of institutionalization throughout the board, like. Whether it's their businesses, whether it's the, their state, uh, they're just less less well organized. They're just less organized there, right? So that that's the main that's the spectrum. Let's say you have like less organized places that are poor, and you call them third world countries, and then you have very organized places with a lot of institutions, and you call it the the, the Western liberal democracies. Now China comes in, and China, uh, e even as imperial China already, right, actually had a very large, a relatively large state bureaucracy. And, and, and under the Chinese Communist Party uh, in the Maoist times, it had a very large, uh, relatively effectively organized state, right? Not a state that provided services to the people a lot necessarily, right. but a state that actually, you know, controlled a lot of things. So, so you have a very disbalanced kind of institutionalization 
And that's, I mean, that's unique to China and the China-controlled world. What you call, what you call the Chensha, right? Mm -hmm. It was throughout it. It was to some extent the characteristic of the Chensha. So not not China in a narrow sense, but also the China-controlled world. Uh, so including South Korea, right. Vietnam, and um, yeah, we still see the legacy of this. Um, China, China is China is not comparable. Con contemporary China is not comparable to any other country in the world because it. You know, if you say if you if you give me like if you give me other less developed dictatorships, then I could say, well, these these countries are, are less developed overall than Western Western liberal democracies. But China is a society where you have this one gigantic monster, this one giant uh, standing in the middle of the field, and then you have you know some development on the side, which has like trouble trouble developing because you have this big giant. And sometimes I compare it to a to a forest with one gigantic super gigantic tree that kind of like kind of avatar-like tree, it kind of casts a shadow, shadow over the whole forest. Uh, but do you think that actually holds back China in terms of its development? You've convinced me that China is unique in its lack of pluralism, or its extremely low institutional pluralism. But mm. is that actually limiting in any way? Because, you know, other countries like oh yes, has lots of pluralism. Oh yes. Well, how, so why do you think it's limiting? I, I'm curious to hear. Why do you think it's limiting? Yeah, why do you think it's limiting? Oh, it's extremely limiting. And uh, and uh, and the thing and the thing is that if you're standing outside of it and you look at it from a distance, you think you know this may work. You know, I came to China. I the first books I read were from Daniel A. Bell. So I really ah, thought you know Bell was who China I was mentioning model, earlier. You know, there okay. may be something to it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so, so I, you know, I, I, and I actually met Bell a few times. So personally, I like him a lot and I think he's a very intelligent man and he asks the right questions. So I, I take him very seriously. Um, um, but I, uh, but I, you know, when I, I, at some point I find out this, you know, the China model, this lack of pluralism, this, this, this fatherly guidance by a centralized uh, party state is actually does tremendous harm. And it's, uh, it's easy from the outside to underestimate all the damage it does. I would just give you a few examples, right? Okay. So what the actual China model looks like in practice. So recently, uh, a, a leading one of the leading criminologists specialized in on Chinese affairs, uh, Bakken, from the uh, national, um, I think, the Australian National University, so he's a, he's a colleague of yours, uh, he, is, he estimated that the crime statistics in China are 97.5% fabricated, falsified. <laughs> so what I mean by this is that from the crimes that are reported to the police, only 2.5% actually make it, according to this estimate, into the crime statistics. Now, it's important to realize this is not about unreported crime, right? This is not about like crime that happens and it's not reported to the police. It's also not about petty crime that's too insignificant to make it into the files. This this is, this is you have a bunch of crime cases coming into the police, a lot of it being heavy crime, and the police officers and the political commissars and party functionaries on different levels for opportunistic reasons taking out stuff from the statistic using all kinds of tricks. So like it comes in, it's like, oh, we have like, 100 crime cases, and then, well, it's actually 50, you know, and that's passed on. And the next time it's all 50 crime cases. I will tell my superior it's 20, and then it's 20. Oh, it's a, no, it's actually 10. And, and then, you know, it reaches all the way at the top, and then there is some boss, and he says, well, well my predecessor had five, <laughs> and I'm better than my predecessor, so it's four. And, and you know, and then, you know, that's how it works. And, you know, you have this... Um, you have the, uh, the most significant thing is uh, you have the, uh, the migrant population, right, in China, uh, which is also, by the way, you know, an, an effect of the regime, right? It, it has everything to do with the way that the Chinese state treats its subjects, that, it, that people can be an illegal immigrant in their own country. So you have these illegal migrant workers in, in China. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the exact number is, but it ranks into the hundreds of millions. Yeah. And the... Um, uh, they are apparently responsible, at least in the case of Guangzhou, uh, which I'm familiar with, for 80% of the crimes. So it's 80% of the crimes are committed by or to migrant workers, right? But these migrant workers, because they actually 
supposedly registered some, somewhere differently, the police departments in the big cities will not take them into, into, into consideration. Probably won't even help them, but also won't register the crimes that are committed against them because that should be like, that's for a different Dunway, right? Yeah. So a different, a different uh, department somewhere else in the country, supposedly. But so by, by using these kind of tricks, they make everything disappear. So in the end, there's like a complete lack of law and it's a complete jungle. Now, does that hinder modernization? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So this lack of oversight, because you have one institution. So if you had like a pluralistic system where you have like different institutions checking each other, this wouldn't happen. This stuff happens like you can only, you need the Chinese system to have like 97.5 falsification rates of statistics, right? So, so and this, this does do damage. It's not just playing with statistics, like this lack of rule of law underneath like a facade of orderliness. Right. This actually does enormous damage. Like, to give you, give you an, an example, uh, which I'm personally familiar with, um, there was a lady I used to know, she, got a, uh, she has a, a cafe at Peking University, which was very popular, the best cafe on the campus, right? So, but the furniture was very old, so she was thinking of re renewing the furniture, but then she said, no, no, I'm not going to do it, because uh, she wasn't sure that she could still have the building in a few months from now. Oh, okay. So she may be kicked out within just a few months' notice, right. Right? Yeah. within you know, in, within a few months. Why? Because like a lot of these small business owners, they they have like buildings which, uh, like in order to do everything by the books in China, it's kind of impossible. So you have to work via some kind of local party of, official, and then they cut you a deal. They're like, oh, I will help you out, and you can you can be there. But then when they, when they you know when they pull out. You lose your you lose your uh, your place, right? Protection, so that yeah. so that does does do damage to business because from a business logic, it would be good to make an investment, right? But a lot of investments in China are not made. Every you know everywhere businesses are not investing where they should invest, right. because because they're afraid that they're going to lose lose the the business anyway because of this you know they're in, in uncertainty. The trust is diminished, and then at the same time. The Communist Party is forcing large businesses to to invest in uh, these political prestige projects like One Belt, One Road. So the, the flow of money is just constantly manipulated, and in hidden ways, or not so hidden if you if you you know if you know some people, but like on the on like on the on the on the on the surface level, or at least to Westerners and familiar with China, it can seem as if it's all going very well. But you know this enormous economic inefficiency that's produced by this political manipulation is just does. You know, it does it does enormous hidden damage. Right. All right. Well, thanks. I think we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, and I'd like to thank you, Eric C. Hendricks, uh, for appearing on the program. I'm sorry for the technical problems and uh, really appreciate your time. So thank you very much. Uh, I'd also... Thank you, Salvatore. At the end. And I'd also like just to mention, uh, next week we'll have on the program... Uh, Glenn Dyson, who will talk about Russia's geoeconomic strategy for a greater Eurasia. Uh, Eric, it's really been a pleasure talking. Uh, thanks so much for being on the program and for being patient with the technical problems. And I'm sure a lot of people will be looking forward to this, uh, watching this video once it's posted. Thanks a lot.